Hello, everybody. Uh, thanks for coming. Um, I wanted to start this out because Mert was supposed to be here today. Um, I'm just going to read a little couple text messages from him this morning. Hey, you coming to our panel today? He's like, whoops, sorry, I just woke up, LOL. I was like, bro, seriously, you're a rookie. That's OK. We got somebody more attractive than you anyways. So um, with that said, George Harrop here from Step Always Finance. Always ready, man. <laughs> Always ready to go. Uh, so today we're talking about um, explorers and inter interpreting data for the masses. We've come a long way from the early days of, um, we'll get into it in a little bit, just a simple Solana Explorer and a wallet called Solid. Um, so before we really get into it, I'm going to let everybody give a quick little introduction down the row. Um, I think you know who most of them are, but uh, we'll, we'll go ahead and let them introduce themselves anyways. Yeah, hey folks. Uh, my name's Armani, uh, developer. I've been in the Solana ecosystem for, I guess, I don't know, two and a half, three years at this point. Uh, happy to be here. Awesome. My name's George, co founder at Step Finance. We do portfolio dashboard, analytics, events, all sorts of cool stuff, uh, crossroads, all stars. So, yeah, check out Step. Thanks, guys. Hi, I'm Nick. I'm from Solana FM. I'm one of the co founders there, and um, I basically build and plan the product line. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, so like I said, I think one way to kick this off is just like at this point, um, and, and, um, and we've come so far with interpreting data, like in the early days, there was just, as developers, the Solana Explorer existed, and it was essentially sort of, it's really just a debugging tool for, um, for core developers at this point, um, but like it, it did most of its job, lots of complaints around that, um, but like, there was, there was the early days had a lot of stuff, so I'm, I'm sort of just like curious to to hear everybody's sort of like what you everybody on this panel has been in like in the Solana ecosystem for two to three years already. So like when you guys were first developing, like Armani was working on a, one of the OG wallets, George was working on his like aggregator, and, and Nicholas was working on one of the first non explorers um, that that were not created by Solana Labs or Foundation. So like. What were those days like before you started building your products like on Solana? Like what was the like what was the situation like? Well, you keep trolling me for using Solid. <laughs> it was the best wallet, man. Like it was uh, and I, I held it to the very end until the dark days of, of defeat. But no, I think it was uh, it was a bit of a mess, right? Because each each token had a, a different address. You had different token accounts for um, you know, per wallet, right? So you couldn't just send to one address, which was a weird workflow. Um, and yeah, it was quite difficult to communicate that to people. Um, and the wallet was sort of very basic. Uh, and yeah, it was, that was the first sort of year of, I guess, Solana's really catching on. So your grandmother couldn't have used Solana grandmother, at that time? No, probably not. <laughs> no. <laughs> How about you, Armani? Like in the early days, like what was the, exp I, mean, I, I mean, like, I know, what was the experience like for Solana in those early days for like in data interpretation or just like being able to piece it all together? Yeah, I think, so first I would like to apologize to the core engineers for what I'm about to say. Um, <laughs> I think I have a bit of a, uh, maybe a contrarian view on this relative to a lot of the early uh, core developers. But when I first came to Solana, the first most obvious thing that I noticed was missing from the ecosystem, and to be frank, it still is missing from the ecosystem, is the lack of consensus at the social layer around serialization and instruction uh, formats. Um, and the downstream consequences of this manifested itself in multiple, I don't know, suboptimal ways uh, in terms of like how the network evolved. Um, so like maybe the simplest example of this is simply when you go to an explorer and you see bytes, right? This is trivially solvable if you have um, something like Ethereum. They had um, a standard kind of ETH ABI format where you can know exactly how to serialize and deserialize all the data so you can read bytes from uh, the chain and, and then interpret those bytes in a nice structured way um, on Solana. But in the early days, there was a very, uh, a very uh, pure stance, if you want to put it in those terms, from, from um, a lot of the developers at the time that Solana should be a general message bus. It should not be opinionated. It should simply be bytes flowing through the network as fast as humanly possible and not 
you know, the, 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 the opinions of the developers at the core kind of layer should not uh, influence the opinions of the developers at the, uh, at the application layer. And, and on the one hand, that made a ton of sense. Uh, core is core, and, and you know, who are we to kind of uh, give guidance at the app layer, especially if you want to like, you know, decouple those two things and allow each of them to uh, innovate as fast as, as possible um, at, at each level. But on the other hand, it made product development quite, quite challenging. And so this has been a tension that we've seen kind of all over the place, um, uh, both in the early days, but also it, it, even up until today. Yeah. Um, everything from explorers interpreting data to uh, getting s protocol standards into, into wallets and NFT marketplaces and things like this. And um, maybe the most um, uh, recent and, 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 and contentious topic that has been like a downstream consequence of these types of decisions have been um, protocols or the lack thereof um, on, on Solana, namely interfaces. Right. Um, and, and, and I think these are kind of, this is all part of the same conversation that all kind of comes from this uh, fundamental kind of decision that or lack thereof to have uh, unifo uh, unified uh, data interpretation and, and serialization formats on, on chain. So I think that is maybe one of the more uh, uh, core topics uh, as it relates to this conversation. Yeah. Nicholas, so you obviously decided to, were not happy with the Solana Explorer in those early days and decided to build your own and you were literally coding it and I had to pull you out of there just a <laughs> second ago to get you on stage. But anyway, so like what was, what prompted you to say, hey, I, I need to build this thing because what exists today is not useful to me? So I would say about uh, two years ago, I think an anchor didn't have as much adoption as it had today. So it would be pretty hard for you to use IDLs to deserialize as much as you can today. Um, so sorry to all devs who are new, um, who are less than a year, year old inside this space. But if you're a dev like two and a half years ago, it was extremely disgusting to work with parsing and deserialization. Because um, I think if you, if you go back to Solana FM's uh, repository in GitHub, you would see that there's a Rust crate that we open sourced about two years ago. And it was like just a switch case shitload of like, oh, um, bit, uh, base, uh, base, wait, I think bin code deserialized. And then sometimes you, you got to do Bosch deserialize. There's so many different types of like deserialization um, standards that various programs want to adopt. And whoa, it's a, it's a pain in the ass. So, <laughs> so um, and to top things off, explorers at that day, like in 2021 and 22, they don't really like, they, they, it's, it's still not interpretable for devs. Like, like, I mean, I'm a dev, maybe I can read um, by the race, right? It, that's fine. But what if like, um, I'm, I'm not like into that, like I'm just very used to reading JSON data. Um, that's not possible. So yeah, that prompted us to like go head in into working on a parser that can then parse things and then present it in a much more readable way. So yeah, that, that triggered a thought. Right. So like w with all that said, everybody sort of gave some of their sort of like thoughts on, on how things were in the early days, but like what's the, compared to two years ago or whatever we want to call it, like um, whoever wants to go first is like, what's the current landscape in terms of like how, how close are we to getting to where we need to be? Um, and like, what's the, what's the current landscape of, like obviously Armani's working on a wallet, you have an explorer, Steps trying, has, ha, ha, is building an incredible sort of dashboard so you can see all of your NFTs, all your open positions on different exchanges. The whole goal of all of this is to sort of um, make sure that every stakeholder, whether it's a user, whether it's a dev, make sure that everybody gets what they want. And like, I don't know if like, in the current state is like, is there like one thing to rule them all? Probably not. Like, should there be things? So we'll, we'll dive into that. But like current landscape, like how well are we doing and how much further do we need to go? Yeah, I'm happy to take that one. Yeah. I think to me, like one of the, it's kind of obvious, one of the most important things is uh, simply protocol interfaces, kind of just like tagging on to w w my previous comments. Um, we need the ability to have multiple competing program instances that represent the same asset standard. You saw this, namely not to not pick on NFTs, but you saw this in <laughs> NFTs, right? We had like five different um, um, 
competing NFT kind of protocols that popped up over the past year. Yep. Like Magic Eden, Cardinal Labs, you know, Metaplex, Programmable NFTs, CNFTs. It's like literally five right there. Uh, yeah. What's an NFT? We haven't got every letter of the alphabet in front of NFT yet, though. We're, yeah, exactly. we're, we're almost there. Why not? Exactly. <laughs> But an NFT is simply, you know, for all intents and purposes, a set of uh, read and write APIs, right? Give me the URL, uh, give me the royalties, give me the creators, you know, update the metadata, uh, mint it, and destroy it, right? It's like a, a basic API for, for NFTs. And I should be able to simply implement my own program that maybe does my own thing. Maybe I implement royalties in my own special way. Maybe I make some, add, add some fees because I'm a business and I need to operate. Yeah. And I should have the ability um, and the liberty to make those decisions in a self-sovereign way, right? But that's not the case currently. We're all kind of, uh, you know, at the at the behest of of the, uh, the, the 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 people that control the specific program instances. Um, and, and it's not just you know it, it, NFTs. It's any important asset standard. And NFTs are maybe just like the best example because it's the most important asset standard or the most widely used asset standard other than the token program itself. And, and so that's been a point of friction. And it's and it's a very uh, kind of unnecessary uh, source of governance friction that simply doesn't have to exist, right? So you, you, you maybe get a lot of um, technical complexity gone when you have single program in, uh, implementations, uh, but then you get a lot of social complexity that you get as a trade-off, right? So there's no right. free lunch. And so I think uh, protocol interfaces uh, where you can have multiple competing asset standards, where a wallet can simply read new NFT instances or, or read new token instances or whatever without actually having to do extra work is, is really what you want to get to. And other ecosystems like Ethereum and others have this uh, with their ERC-20 standards. And, and this and allows they, wallets and, and, and explorers and everybody to move faster without having to like knock on somebody's telegram and be like, hey, can, like, you, exactly, can, yeah. you, can you help me do this thing? Because otherwise you can't do anything. As a wallet, we don't have to do anything, right? You can just come as a developer, make your own NFT protocol, and it should just automatically work. That's the whole point of, of a protocol. That's the whole point of an interface. And, and um, it's like you know, Fire Dancer can come along and, and hook up to the network, um, even though it's a totally different uh, implementation of the validator code. Um, and you, know, you should just be able to like, give a document of the API, and I should be able to just go implement it. And so I think that is one of the most important things that is an unsolved problem in the Solana ecosystem that would just be a big, uh, a, a big win for you know, interpreting information right. and, and all the second order kind of uh, competitive consequences that are uh, a nice result of that. Right. I, I think it comes back to standardization and documentation. I mean, we, we've been building passes for all sorts of different weird programs on STEP to be able to get, you know, however many versions Magic Eden has, six, seven, I don't know. Um, what are the, uh, you know, how do we decode the instructions for version two that's no longer supported, but we need to get that information uh, to, to show people's positions or whatever it is historically over time. So we've had to deal with a lot of technical debt of trying to do that, and it's still kind of a problem. Certainly, Anchor's helped out a lot uh, over the last few years, but if we're talking about like where we were and where we are now, I think we're in, definitely in a better place, right, we're in the standardization front, um, but there's still a lot of work to go. Uh, we would love to not have to be poking people in Telegram, being like, hey, bro, how does this work? Hey, uh, what is this instruction doing? Uh, you know, and, and also you know, standardization of SDKs and, and all that sort of stuff that, that people like to, to provide often that doesn't have the best documentation all the time. Um, so uh, yeah, you know, that would be my comment, is just more in the direction of where yeah. we're already going. People are shipping fast, but they're not shipping docs. Yep, no docs, <laughs> no idea what, what anything does. Uh, and it just, it's just a lot of back and forth, which wastes time. Yeah. Right? And it's just, it's just, yeah, you know, it can take a day, especially if people are around the world, to hear information back. And then that delays decision making and blah, blah, blah. And it can work out to be a week to do something that perhaps should be uh, you know, a lot quicker than that. Yeah. Nick, how about you? Like, like current state of things for you also, Feel free to talk about some of your upcoming um, things that are happening with Solana FM as well. So, like, but well, what's the current state of things for you in terms of like data interpretation for the masses? Like, whether it be from the user's perspective or from your perspective, like, where where are we right now? Alpha so, alert. <laughs> so, so this is like, this is actually very perfect for us because um, the panel is in a layer, right? You have an explorer, you have you have a, a profiling tool a wallet profiling tool, and then you have a wallet, right? Yeah. So, so um, perfect time for me to say this, which is there are so many layers for us uh, that we need to build and explore for. And uh, one big mistake that we probably did together with the rest of the explorer providers in the space 
would be to base the entire source code based off the open source explorer. And that's, <laughs> it's, it's as if just forking so, uh, Solid and then just doing a new wallet by yourself, right? It doesn't make sense. So, so what we did and what we set out to do over the past six months was that we wanted to find a way to layer them out. Okay, so we, we got to find a way to connect to APIs. Okay, that's one. And then we got to find another, another layer to do um, generalized parsing, right? Um, find, a, find a single unified standard to parse everything that we can, right? Um, you, you, you can parse uh, Rust-based programs, but you got to find some, some guy who wrote like, the Rust code, and then you got to reverse engineer that, that logic so that you can deserialize the data inside. Um, and then you have IDLs as well. So it makes so much sense when IDLs came in, where if there's a way for you to um, generate an IDL based on a Rust program, you can then parse and deserialize everything in just one single standard. If you're not publishing your IDLs, shame on you. <laughs> please, please. Yeah, and, and <laughs> we, we have something coming up on our, on our team tomorrow in, a, in another like, session. So, so that's, that's something to look forward to for IDLs. Um, but I don't want to like, review so much yet. But, but yeah, it's, it's one unified way to parse and deserialize um, instructions. And then you have one last layer, which is as an Explore product, the goal for us to, is, is to make um, information as readable as possible for you. Like, dude, like it takes us 30 seconds for us to understand an entire transaction. Like, why? <laughs> can't, can't you just like look at a bank transaction, right? Your iBanking app, when you read the entire list, it takes you less than 10 seconds to know what you've done over the past six, six days, seven days, right? If you do a lot of transactions. And that's what Explorer's got to be. And um, that's where explorers can also empower um, tools like wallet profiling tools and wallets because we do have to build the foundational APIs. And I think that's, that's the main core, or main mode of our job as an explorer. And that also empowers like, users who utilize our explorer um, for day-to-day -day use, right? Like, oh, this is a swap. Like, what's the slippage to tolerance? I don't have to scroll down and read the instructions, right? That doesn't make sense. So yeah, that's, that's the current state. Yeah. So. Uh, I was going to ask another question, like what are the issues, but I think we've sort of outlined oh a lot of the issues already, but I, I think the, uh, one of the big questions is like who, I think we care about everybody, but like, who, like the perspectives that you guys are sort of talking about seem to be more technical and from devs, but like at the end of the day, like for the masses means like more than the 75 devs on Solana, it means that like we're talking about like millions of people around the world to be able to be like, oh, I get that. And like, I sort of just had an epiphany and I never really thought about before that a wallet is essentially um, an explorer is in, it, in itself. But what's the, how do you solve the problem of being able to nail all of those profiles? Like, in, is, is it a single thing? Is it a single, like Nick and I had chatted about this. It's like, what's the sweet spot? Um, should there be multiple things? Should there be one thing that can be whatever you want it to be, which also adds layers of complexity? So I don't know, like, who had some opinions on, like, how we, um, what's, where should we get to for that data interpretation for the masses? Like, like so that your mom is able to understand what she's looking at. Yeah, I, I don't think this is a problem specific to explorers or wallets. You have to have a well-defined customer and build for it. I think most explorers, as they currently exist, are very clearly targeted at developers. Right. Otherwise, why are you showing bytecode? Uh, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Wallets have, have, have kind of gone in the other direction. And so maybe that's maybe a nice way to think about it. You know, wallets and explorer for, uh, you know, um, maybe developers, but, you know, maybe less advanced people and explorers are more explorers for developers. And maybe that's one nice demarcation. but. Yeah, I think you have to define the user and not try to build a, a catch-all product um, when trying to interpret information because people want different things. Yeah, true. And I mean, like, I think George has a probably unique perspective out of like YouTube because his focus is core is, is primarily users. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we we think about this a lot, right? And and on step on the core product, the dashboard, everything's broken down into different modules that make sense for people. Like we could have just got your user position, shoved it all in a table, and said, job done, right? And then it's like, eh, it doesn't really tell you that much. Like, what if my, what's the PNL on my perp position in Drift or Zeta or something right now? Like, it, it's, there's a lot of, like, little niche things uh, like that, or, um, you know, validator staking, you know, where's my stake at, or I'm staking in this random project somewhere, and what's the APY of that? So there are things that I don't think you can just make one table to just shove it all in there. So 
if we're talking about how do we appeal to the masses, I think there is um, the presentation of information is important. And recently, uh, we put a lot of effort into debuting our transaction history v3, which recently came out, which is essentially you can export to CSV past data uh, at the instruction level of a whole bunch of uh, programs from that we've been dealing with for years um, to get an actual transaction history that makes sense. Because a lot of times, if you go to like the old Explorer or something like that, and you look at a wallet, it's like, OK, here's just a bunch of TXIDs with a whole bunch of information which doesn't tell me anything about what I did with my wallet, right? Because the average person can't tell that that transaction was actually like, I'm paying back a loan from this protocol over here, and then I'm swapping it for something else over here. Makes, you know, that there's no indication of that, right? Or from, you know, how things have been with explorers, right? And I think that's what Solana FM is looking to solve. But ultimately, like we had to put that into the transaction history uh, and present it in a way that actually makes sense for people. And then it comes back to the standardization problem of making sure that it's actually easier to get that uh, instruction level data to find out what's going on within that program. Um, so it's not just a bunch of transactions that are unknown uh, or something like that. So yeah, look, we put a lot of effort into that. We're going to continue to always just be building on that and breaking it down into different modules that make sense uh, for, for people. Yeah. And then for us, it's just more of pivot. So with, with I think it's about a year old now that um, Solana FM has used this library called React Flow. So I think uh, Anatoly was presenting in uh, the first session yesterday during the, the introduction of Bitcoin, and he was showcasing Jupiter's um, diagram of like how the hops are going through, 30% from Orca or like 40% from OpenBook. Um, that's, that's cool. Like the, the use of graphs would be a very visual way for us to understand transactions. Um, that's, that's the reason why we introduce um, transaction flow as well. But there's a huge problem, which is the underlying mechanism. So, so that's why for us this time around, we're putting more emphasis on devs. Because if we don't get as much parse or deserializing, uh, deserialization coverage, we won't be able to do what's above, right? If you want to present human readable information at the end of the day, if you don't get the, the bottom layers done beforehand, you're going to end up in a problem where, oh shit, like I can cover six out of seven DeFi protocols. Where's the last guy? Oof. He's not deserialized yet. He doesn't have his IDL. So that, that's the core focus on us right now. And we feel that we've got to get like, the, the dev-centric problem solved first. Then we can hop on to the human readable side. But of course, um, later in the session today uh, on, on our site for Solana FM, we'll, we'll probably showcase like, a snippet of like, what is going to be human readable for explorers and um, how we want to bring like, IDLs out to the public and the masses. Like, really make sure that open source tooling for deserialization is available for everyone, right? We're not, we're not keeping it closed source, we're keeping it open source. Yeah. yeah. So there was, like, there was another thought that sort of like came into my mind, and like Mert, who's sleeping right now, um, was supposed to talk a little bit about this. But like, in the early days, any developer who's been here long enough knows about dreaded um, get program accounts calls and, and all the efforts and all of the, the, the changes that have been made um, and, and obviously Merit being one of those people at the forefront of that. So like how much has like the indexer sort of ecosystem and these new tools that sort of just do all of that work for you changed like um, changed your lives like and, and, and experiences with building because they obviously indexers can, can do things more efficiently because that's their sole purpose. But I'm assuming that each of you guys are, are using those indexers. So like, how, how substantially has that changed things um, since those early days? Yeah, I, I might jump in there that I guess about a year and a half ago, we were running into scaling issues and performance with the old way of getting information about a wallet and the user's positions is you just smash it through the RPC node, right? <laughs> You're just doing a ton of RPC calls to find out what's going on, right? But you reach a, a certain point with some wallets that just have so many positions, so many different things going on that it can take... Degenerates. Yeah, degenerates. It can take 30 seconds, 45 seconds to load, right? And that's unacceptable. Um, so we had to then go, OK, we need to be indexing all of this, and we need to be serving it way quicker. And then we had the advent of things like Geyser and, and stuff like that, right? Um, and yeah, we've been heavily down that path of moving as much as possible to our back end uh, and in order to serve that really quickly. And do you do your own indexing? Yeah. Oh, you do? Yeah, we've okay, been cool. 
rocking our own stuff for about a year now. Um, so, yeah, and I guess our use case is a little bit different to everyone else. So often, sort of generic indexing solutions can't quite meet the, stu the, the requirements that we need. So, yeah, we've had to just be Rambo about it and, and do our own thing. But it has led to really amazing performance you know, increases. Like I said, like 30 to 45 seconds down to like one to two seconds, if that, uh, for like really intense wallets that, like our test wallet at Step has a position in pretty much every protocol, I think, <laughs> on Solana. We, we try and make it uh, have that. So uh, that is a really big wallet with a lot of stuff going on. And I think it loads within like two or three seconds, something yeah. like that. And that's the benchmark that we need to, to use. Right. Yeah, for us, we, we, do, we do use indexes, but our perspective is a bit different. It's a pain in the ass. Um, <laughs> Oh my god, that sigh was so huge. So what, like, explain a little bit. Like, like if you want to get an indexer up, you've got to hire, like, what, two devs or one, and then you've you got yeah. to put his, you, you got to throw him inside the room, right? Like, oh, go do that, do an indexer. And then um, sooner or later when, you, when he do. comes out, yeah, when he comes <laughs> out of the room, right, and he says, oh, I'm done, and then there's another use case in requirement where we've got to come up with another indexer, and then, oh, Oh fuck, like we gotta go back in again. <laughs> so um, indexes are great, they improve performance, they they solve this specific problem that you want to solve, but it's not really worth the human manpower and resources that we have. It's we, not. Yeah, we, we could have just taken that to really go go forward and go closer towards the masses, right? We, like really for the masses, like not just solving internal problems for the product. Um, so so that's my thought. And, um, but yeah, it, it did give us a fair share of um, advantages. Like, for example, we, we were about to launch, like, I, I don't think there's a way for you to view all of the token and system program transfers, all the token transfers you've been doing since, since the start of time for your, for your wallets um, with a date time range like, like, like filter, but we are about to launch that out. So um, yeah, there, there are advantages to indexes, but yeah, the manpower, the manpower requirements are just nuts. It sounds like both of you so far have sort of said that indexers are useful. You're saying that like they're a lot of resource yeah, heavy, yes. like on, on manpower, um, and the generic ones, like like somebody who already has an indexer, it doesn't necessarily fit all of your needs. So you have to like spend manpower on that. How about you, Armani? So if you just give your, just tell us how you really <laughs> feel. If, if you go to the first version of Anchor you will see an index uh, attribute macro uh, inside of the IDL. So you define your account, you put hashtag index over the variable, and that translates into the IDL. And the intention of that macro was to, for somebody to create a business out of generalized indexing. Um, and I think it doesn't get you 100% of the way there, but it certainly does give you, get you 80% of the way there. And I think it solves a lot of these tensions that you, know, that you guys are referring to. But you need um, the IDLs. You need the IDLs. You need the IDLs, and you need consensus over kind of some interpretation of the data. Shame. Um, and so I, th I, guess I'm, I guess that's one thing I'm like surprised about. I think there, there's been some companies like uh, I see a uh, Vibe Network hat in the, in the audience, like Vibe, that have attempted this problem. And I, I, I think it's certainly solvable. It's just a matter of engineering work. Um, but we've seen things like the DAS API. I never know how to pronounce it. I don't even know what DAS stands for. Um, but the, 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 the generalized indexing API that, um, that came out of Metaplex that tries to solve a lot of these things. But really, I think for a lot of use cases, I should just be able to give my, my IDL, and I should just get a Postgres table. Uh, with all of my accounts, um, and I should be able to, you know, run SQL queries, um, you know, join and match things, and build indexes all from an IDL, and it should happen automatically. Um, and so I think, uh, I think it's all kind of rooted in the thing I keep talking about, which is generalized uh, uh, interpretation of data via, you know, IDLs and serialization formats. It's all the same problem, but like. If you get the foundation right, then all these second order uh, downstream effects kind of become a lot easier. But I think that's one approach that would be pretty interesting that I still think is quite compelling to me. Yeah, I think the, I think the interesting thing here is like we're talking to some very smart people who have been here for quite a while and talking about how, how much of a pain in the ass that it is to do these things. So like, like I, I spend my days trying to onboard new developers and then like, then I'm like, come on, it's easy, it's fun. Like, come over here to Solana and like, imagine like the pain that like that that we we 
it's not chewing glass anymore. Like, let's be real. Like, you can if you want to. Armani still does it. A lot of redacted Noah. Like, there's a lot of masochists in the ecosystem that like really truly love to just like solve hard problems. Um, but what? This can't be the case for for DevX forever. When people have to constantly deal, like you're talking about having to put throw a guy in a room that's an entire human being solving one little indexing problem and like how do we like what's the next step like I mean I think maybe you've already alluded to it like IDLs are going to help solve this like but like is there anything else that we can do to like get to that next place where it's like it's all like can we get to a place where it's essentially almost all solved so this might yeah, this is kind of a pie in the sky kind of <laughs> thought, but one thing I think that we haven't seen enough about en enough of, um, and it's mainly because people are afraid to do it, is is create tokens around shared open source software. And the reason why tokens are important is because it incentivizes people to actually go do the thing. It always comes down to are really smart people incentivized to do this because they're incentivized to go do anything else in the world. And I feel like the token mechanism is the most potent tool that you have to incentivize people to get stuff done. But the fact of the matter is, is that most people are, are scared, for lack of a better word, because they don't know what it means to create a token, right? What are the consequences of, of for the legal consequences or the, you know, the social consequences? Yeah, What's yeah, the yeah. proper way of doing it, right? A lot of well-intentioned, really smart people simply don't do it because they don't know how to do it in a way that makes sense. And then some people do, not realizing the repercussions that can come from creating those tokens. Yeah, exactly. And then you have to delete your account and disappear. <laughs> but open source software, it's extremely important, and I think it's tokens are the, probably the most powerful tool that we have to promote shared open source software. And so I'm, I'm really excited to see things like, you know, not to go too, off too much of a tangent, yeah, yeah. but like Armada and and these these like you know the SDKs, pads. yeah, for for creating a vibrant um, ecosystem to coordinate humans to solve these problems. Right. Because the incentive mechanism that you know blockchains allow is the most interesting, most powerful tool that's truly unique to to decentralized networks. Right? It's about incentivizing millions of people all around the world to all care about the same thing. Right? And, yep. and I think that's something I would like to see more of. But it's unclear exactly how to do that in a way that people are comfortable with. Yeah. And it's compliant and all these things. There's also some. There's some people that have got moved in like to this sort of space. There's like, there's Cubic that's doing quadratic funding and like Gitbook obviously was the start of a lot. Like it's like incentivizing really smart people to solve really hard problems. So I fully agree. I, I would love to see more of this generalization stuff. Maybe it's with what Solana or FM is doing. And I think we'll probably get there at the end of the day. But for us right now, that doesn't solve our problem today. Like, we have, we have people that are like, I cannot read my transaction history to do my taxes. Or I cannot, about the, yeah. I cannot feed that into my software, right? Like, I cannot give that to a tax company, just a bunch of TX IDs. They don't know what you're doing. Like, you, they need to know that that was, you know, you're sending tokens into a staking protocol and what that means, or I'm paying back a loan. And then we get into the discussion of, well, we need to pass that data and we need to know the instructions and the RDLs and blah, blah, blah. So it's like, if we get the more generalized solutions, that'll make everyone's lives better. Um, but I guess for us at the moment, we still have to deal with all of this horrible burden of the past if yeah. it would actually solve people's problems right now today. And we can either A, ignore it and go, sorry, bro, come back in a year, or like just use these protocols over here. But people don't do that. And then a new thing pops up tomorrow, and then uh, some new protocol comes along, they haven't published IDLs, they haven't got anything open source, no idea, and then they go, my transaction history doesn't work, you know, you're not showing me my token balances, whatever, and then we're like, oh, okay, well, I guess we'd have to get back on this train and get back on the horse. <laughs> yeah. All right, Nick, final thoughts. Uh, we're, 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 we got about a minute left, so, like, like let us have it. Just two things. Okay. Um, one. Please publish more IDLs, please. <laughs> <laughs> it, it helps everyone a lot. And the second thing is we're, we're very committed to extending the capabilities of IDLs. I, I think uh, IDLs are a great idea, a great start for like, generalizing how you can 
interpret different types of instructions and programs. Um, but yeah, Solana FM, we, we are committed to extend um, that, that descriptor language to make it more readable and more um, usable. So yeah, those, those are my thoughts. Cool. Is that it? Any, any final thoughts from you guys? I'm, I'm going to eat up all this time. We've got 12 seconds left. GM. <laughs> GM. GM. OK. No, two words. <laughs> those two words on your chest. Yeah, true. All right, yeah. Yeah. Fuck it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys. Thanks for coming. Um, appreciate your time. <laughs>